Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Hello, we're going to be finishing uh, the book of Leviticus today. We're going to be in chapters 26 and 27. Now, the book ends a rather unusual way because you would think that 26 is the normal conclusion to the book and 27 almost seems to be an appendix, but it's going to deal with specific laws about vowing. 26 is very interesting because it seems to prove the historicity of the Mosaic authorship of Leviticus. There are several places, both in the ancient Near East treaties, particularly the Hittite treaties, which would be in central Turkey today, of the second millennium B.C. and the pattern we find in some parts of the Old Testament, uh, particularly the book of Deuteronomy and Joshua 24. And here in Leviticus 26, that same uh, Hittite suzerain treaty pattern uh, seems to be unfolded again, which shows the historicity. The thing that bothers me about that is that in verse 1, we're going to mention four kinds of idolatry that don't seem to be Egyptian but Canaanite. And Leviticus is reported to be given by God on Mount Sinai. So there would have to be a prophetic element in what God said about the worship of the Canaanites versus from experience. Or Moses, in writing later as he prepared them before they enter on the plains of Moab, may have come back and uh, explained further some of the elements that were given to him by God on Mount Sinai. But the very end of the book purports that Moses was given these, verse 34, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses, the sons of Israel, out ma at Mount Sinai. It is obvious there are some editorial additions in the Pentateuch, and of course those may have been done by Moses or Joshua, some would say by Jeremiah and others by Ezra. Uh, now, let's look at the chapter if we could then. Uh, basically what it's going to be is a cursing and blessing close. The blessing is recorded in, in verses 1 through 13 and the cursing in verses 14, 39. And since God knows that his people had a propensity and a tendency to go after other gods, there's going to be a call to repentance in, in verses 40 through 46. Now, let's look at the chapter if we could. You shall not make for yourself, number these in your Bible. Number one, an idol. Nor shall you set up for yourselves, number two, an image. Or, number three, a sacred pillar. Nor shall you place, number four, a figured stone on your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. Now, this reflects several different aspects. I think overall it probably goes back to the Ten Commandments, which most of these later chapters here uh, in Exodus and, and uh, in Leviticus are trying to expound the Ten Commandments that was given in Exodus chapter 20. So we go back to chapter Exodus 20, verses 3 through 6, about you shall have no other God beside me, shall not make graven images. I am, I'm alone going to be your God. These seem to reflect that, but very specific ways. Now, for a reference to the idols, and of course an idol is that which is made by human hands that human beings bow down to. Uh, it's a ridiculous kind of thing. In our day, it may be a materialistic kind of things instead of little graven images. But you might want to see Leviticus 19.4 where these idols are talked about. Where it says an image. Now, some say that refers to Exodus 20 verse 4 where it says, don't make an image of anything else in heaven. But in this context, it doesn't seem to be making an image or representation of Yahweh because the things that surround them have to do with Canaanite uh, fertility worship. So I would say the image here is maybe one of the little images like of uh, the mother goddess that we have found uh, or that kind of thing, an image of some kind of other god. And then a sacred pillar. Now a sacred pillar, we understand from archaeology that Baal, which is basically the word for husband or owner, lord, was the uh, uh, storm god of the Canaanite pantheon. Uh, he was the uh, dying god that was resurrected every uh, spring, kind of a fertility god. Um, his consort, at least in the Bible, is Astura, although in the Canaanite documents of Rosh Shamra, it is, uh, Astura is simply his sister. But uh, in this context, I think, it's got to be this uplifted pillar. Now, some say it was a symbol of the male sex organ, though it was not formed, so we can't tell that. 
Ashtera, the female deity, was worshipped by either a planted tree or a carved stake, and we're not sure which. And so you might want to see for a sacred pillar Exodus 23, verse 24, and Exodus 34, verse 13. And then when it says a figured stone, uh, this same thing is mentioned in Numbers 33:52, uh, and you may want to refer to that. As again, this seems to refer to Canaanite worship. I think many of the laws of the Pentateuch uh, deal with a reaction against the worship of Egypt and the worship of the Canaanites. Uh, as you might remember in Exodus, excuse me, uh, Genesis 15:16, God said the abomination of the Amorites is not yet complete, but when it is, God's going to kick them out of the land. When the Jews do the very same thing the Canaanites did, God will take them out of the land too. Matter of fact, this this chapter graphically says the land will vomit you out. And I think that's very strong. We saw that earlier too in the book of Leviticus. Now, notice in verse 2, You shall keep my commandments. That seems to reflect Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. And reverence my sanctuary. That may refer to Exodus 20, verse 7, where it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And of course, God's name was evoked in worship services. And that may be the reference here to uh, saying his name along with other gods or saying it with their reverence or lack of faith. I am the Lord. Now, of course, the word Lord, as you know, in all caps, from Exodus 3.14 is the very same word as the word I am. So really it's I am the I am. And I think it means the ever-living, only living God. It's in all caps here. So it's that covenant name for God, uh, that special name that only the Hebrews knew. Notice in verse 3, the if-then. This is the idea of the covenant. The covenant had stipulations on both sides. Uh, if people ask me all the time, was the covenant conditional or unconditional? Yes. It's conditional on every generation's response, but it's unconditional on the promises of God. So if you notice over here in, the, in verse 14 of the chapter, it says, but if you do not obey, it's going to assume they're not going to obey. And then in verse 40, it's going to assume though they don't obey, there is a way to be right with God through confession and repentance. So look at the if-then. I think you'll find most covenants. Matter of fact, I think everything between God and man is an if-then. God, God comes to us in grace, but man must respond in faith. That's true across the board of biblical faith. If you walk in my statutes, that shows lifestyle, not just certain rules, certain days. It's very much like walk in my ways. The early church was called the way. It reflects a lifestyle. Biblical faith is not a decision primarily. It's a decision followed by a lifestyle. And keep my commands so as to carry them out. Then I will give you. Now notice what he mentions here. Agricultural uh, uh, bounty, a lot of children, security, several things he's going to give them. Now this, this is, uh, reflects, uh, I think, an expansion of this found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 27 and 28. It's the cursing and blessing section, this very same kind of thing. I told you the whole book of Deuteronomy is similar to the uh, Hittite suzerain pattern we find here in chapter 26. Now, this cursing and blessing was a way to show the benefits of keeping the covenant and a warning against breaking the covenant. I think much of Israel's history can be understood by looking at this chapter, looking at Deuteronomy 27 and 28, which was fulfilled, by the way, uh, in the Promised Land in, in Joshua 8. And the same Hittite Caesarean pattern of cursing and blessings comes in in Joshua 24 in Joshua's farewell. And I think you ought to look at those. Now let's just look through here at the blessings if they do. They're going to have rains in their season. Their land will yield its produce. The, the trees will bear fruit. Uh, there will be grain for them to thresh. There will be grapes in their harvest. Uh, they'll eat the food and live securely in their land. There will be no enemies. He's going to grant peace in verse 6. They'll be free from wild beasts. They'll be free from war. The sword won't pass through there. Uh, their enemies will flee before them. Uh, he will make them fruitful and multiply you, and I will confirm my covenant. The, the presence of blessing, prosperity, was a way to say God is with us. The covenant is, is in full swing. Uh, and, and, and on it goes. I will give uh, eat. You will eat the old supply and clear out the old because the new is coming. Produce every year. Moreover, look at verse 11 and 12. Two parallel statements that I think are very important. I will make my dwelling among you. And the, verse 12, I will walk among you. That's tremendous covenant promise. It's the, it's the idea that the tabernacle will remain with them. That God will be their God and they will be His people and God will be in their midst. The great promise of biblical faith is 
Even the Great Commission, Jesus says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And at the end of the age, we're going to be with God in heaven. We're going to be right with Him. So the great promise is His presence. And that's what we have here. Notice the covenant formula that ends verse 12. I will be your God and you will be my people. That's the ultimate of the covenant relationship. Now, in verse 13, it gives the basis. This is a regular part of the Hittite suzerain treaties where the, the historical acts of the great king. And here the exodus is brought up again. The exodus is a tremendous act of the grace of God. The Jews went back to it again and again. God brought them out of the land of Egypt before he ever gave them the law. He showed them grace before he ever gave them the stipulations. Of course, that was also the promise going back to Genesis 15, 16, that they would go into the land of Egypt, but God would deliver them uh, at a certain time. And that's what we see here. Now, verse 14 begins to express that if you do not obey, what's going to happen to them? And my goodness, the cursing is a lot more lo longer in detail than the blessing, which is characteristic of these patterns, treaty patterns of the second millennium B.C. I was noticing here... Um, if you look at this, it says, uh, God begins to say, I in turn will do this to you. And then look at verse 10. If, if also after these things you do not obey. Look at verse 21. If then you act hostile, uh, with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey. Look at verse 23. If by these things you are, are not turned to me, but are host, uh, but shew with hostility against me. Look at verse 27. Yet in spite of this you do not obey. Now, friend, what is all this? Well, what's God saying is much what the Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 and following say. God punishes them. But it's not the punishment of an irate, angry kind of enemy. It's the punishment of a father. The very purpose of the discipline was to bring back his kids. So he's disciplining them so as to bring them back. You know that's true because the whole last few verses of this chapter are on if you repent, when you repent. But uh, notice the severity of this. All the plagues of Egypt, all the, the cursings of the Canaanites will fall upon the people of God if they do not obey. In verse 19, it was interesting to me to notice that, um, first of all, let me go back. They're going to have diseases. They're going to have no produce. Their enemies are going to take them away. They're going to have no rain. And notice it says, I will break down the pride of your power. You might want to read Deuteronomy 11, 8 through 20 again. We begin to think that everything we have is of our own strength and our own hands. No, my friend, it's from God, and God will do whatever it takes to remind us of that. Wild beasts will multiply and kill many. There's going to be the enemies beginning in verse 23 and following. A, a siege. They're going to go in the city, and the siege will happen. And during that siege, they'll have uh, uh, lack of water, lack of food, disease. They're going to eat their own children. Look at verse 29. We know that actually happened twice, Second Kings 6, uh, verses uh, 28 and 29, and Lamentations 2, 20. They actually ate their own kids during the siege, the sieges of the Old Testament. Notice in verse 30, they're reminded again, their idolatry has caused this problem. The high places are the place they worship the Baals. The book of Hosea says, on every high hill and under every green tree, they play the harlot after Baal. You see, they thought Baal was the fertility god. And they had to worship Baal to get the crops to grow and the rain to fall. And Yahweh says, I give those things to you, not Baal. And then cut down your own incense altars. Now, cut down implies they're made of wood. The Ashtara was made of wood. There are several places in the Old Testament that this this incense altar made of wood and the Ashtara, the symbol of the female fertility god, go hand in hand. Let me show these to you. Second Chronicles 34, verses 4 and 7 is another one in Isaiah. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I believe it's Isaiah 27, 9. Okay? Now, notice it says, um, by the way, incense was to get the attention of the deity. Look at verse 31. God says, I will not smell your smoothing aromas. What does that mean? He will reject their sacrifices. He will not respond to their sacrifices. Look at verse 33. Oh my. 30, 32 and 33. I will scatter them among the nations. Here's the promise of exile. That's exactly what happened. The northern ten tribes. As you know, the kingdom split in 922 into Jeroboam the first and Rehoboam, Solomon's son, in the south. And then in 722, Assyria took the northern ten tribes captive. And then in 586, Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar took the southern two tribes captive. And all the people of God were out of the promised land. The land was so important to them. And now they were removed from it because of their flagrant sin. Notice verse 36. Those who are left in the land are going to have terrible fear. Verse 37. Those who are left are going to have 
terrible panic. In verse 39, it's interesting to me because it mentions that uh, there are two reasons for this problem. Number one, or number A, is because of their own iniquity, and B, is because of the sin of their fathers. That same thing is repeated in verse 40. If they're willing to repent of the sin that they have done and the sin of their fathers, and I'll put it this way, do you mean I'm responsible biblically not only for my own sin but for the sin of my culture, the sin of my family? Yes. There comes a time where a corporate repentance is an appropriate thing. Uh, Moses uh, prayed on behalf of all the people. The high priest prayed on behalf of all the people in Leviticus 16. Uh, we will find many of the prophets praying for the, the entire people. We have sinned. God, help us. I think Christians are responsible for their society in which they live to try to influence it. Notice here, if they will confess, the ideal means to publicly acknowledge is a New Testament Greek word. Uh, now, uncircumcised heart in verse 41. Uncircumcision was a metaphor of rebellion. We don't know exactly the symbolism of circumcision, but it talks about an uncircumcised heart, an uncircumcised lip, an uncircumcised ear. It kind of means that which we refuse to give to God. And so a circumcised heart is an open heart. A circumcised ear is a hearing ear. A circumcised lip is a, a lip that speaks praises to God and not blasphemies. Notice what God said He'll do in verse 42. Then, if you do this, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and remember my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham, as well as I'll remember the land. He'll go back and remember Genesis chapter 12 where this all began, where he promised a seed to Abraham and he promised a land to Abraham. Look at verse 44. I will not reject them. There's the hope that though they break the covenant, God will be faithful. Amen. Notice in verse 45 it says, In the sight of all the nations. What's significant about that? God wanted Israel to be a kingdom of priests. How he dealt with them was to be a witness to all the nations. But God help us, Israel gave off the wrong signals, and all the nations saw was the judgment of God on them. Uh, now in verse 27, it's very unusual, but it's about vows. Uh, it's several times in the book of Leviticus, chapter 7, verse 16, chapter 22, verses 18 through 23, chapter 23, 38. It's mentioned vows, but what is a vow? Well, a vow is when someone says, Oh God, if you help me, I'll give this to you. Oh God, if you heal me, I'll give this to you. Oh God, I'm so thankful, I'll give this to you. Now that could involve giving yourself to God, giving your family to God, giving people to God that you owned, giving... Uh, your animals to God, giving your possessions to God. So this chapter kind of lays out what to do if you give something to God. Really, many of us believe this chapter is uh, severe warnings against making rash vows. The Bible talks about the seriousness of making a vow. It never says we ought to make them, but it says if we do, we ought to pay it. You ought to read these. Numbers chapter 30, the whole chapter deals with vows. Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23. Proverbs 20, verse 25, Ecclesiastes 5, 5, all talks about the seriousness of making a promise to God. We often call this foxhole religion. Well, this says God takes that seriously when we say this. So, a vow is the redemption. This is about the redemption of things we've given to God. Notice it mentions here, when a man makes a difficult vow. The reason I think the word difficult is here is because it involves a person. Remember how... Uh, Jephthah gave the first one to come out of his house to sacrifice to God, and it was his daughter. Remember how Hannah gave Samuel, her son, to God? That's an example of this. Now, notice it's, it's the idea of purchasing people. And here we have the cost of people. In verses 1 through 8, it talks about men and women. It talks about young men and old men and young men. Same thing true of women. You have a different price. Uh, it's, it's cheaper for a young person. It's very expensive for a mature man. It's a little less expensive for an old man. It's less in all three categories for a woman because they couldn't do quite the labor, I guess. They're symbolically going to serve God. But since they couldn't serve God, a price was to be paid for them and the money given to the temple. Let me kind of outline this chapter for you. Verses 1 through 8 deal with people. Verses uh, uh, 9 through 13 deal with animals. 9 and 10, clean animals. 11 through 13, unclean animals. 14 through 24 deal with possessions. Verses 14 and 15 with your house that you gave to God. Number 16 through 24 with a piece of land. And then 4 deals with... Uh, uh, the, the, we have the firstborn, verse 26 and 27, that already belongs to God. And then we have the idea of... Um, a more severe kind of vow called a harem, 
which meant totally dedicated to God, could not be purchased back. And the last thing we had are tithes. Now, tithes were already given to God, but this seems to be uh, some kind of special tithe, the way of buying back agricultural produce with money than taking the money to the temple, something like that. And I'll show that to you when we come to it. Uh, if I could at this point, notice in verse 3 it mentions the shekel of the sanctuary. In verse 25 it gives us a description of that. It says a shekel shall be 20 giras. Now a gira is a Babylonian term and why it's used this early I'm not real sure. Uh, there were different kinds of shekel. This standardized the price, okay? You mean a man could dedicate himself to God and then purchase himself back? Yes, that seems to be the truth. But all the way through here it mentions the idea of adding a fifth part to it which means the idea of if you give it to God, you ought to keep it. If, it's, if, you, if you make a rash vow, it's going to cost you. Also, notice in verse 10, if you give an animal, you can't exchange it. If you try to exchange it, both animals belong to God. And the same thing is true over here in verse... Uh, let's see. Verse... Uh, I lost my place. Uh, 20, uh, verse 33. If you try to exchange an animal that you've given to God... The animal you try to exchange plus the animal that he originally gave to God. Both belong to him. So uh, it really costs to do that. Notice in verse 13, the idea of one-fifth. Verse 19, the one-fifth. Um, let's see. Verse 31, one-fifth. Verse 27, one-fifth. It costs a man to not keep his vow or try to buy it back. Now, notice if you would, it mentions here in verses 16 through 19, this idea of the year of Jubilee. What's that all about? Well, we learned back in Leviticus 25 that there was a year of jubilee and that every 50 years the land went back to the original owner. So if a man gave a piece of property, it had to be prorated depending on his relationship to the year of jubilee. Now look at verse 20 and 21. Another, another uh, reason why I think this chapter is against rash vows. If a man uh, gave a piece of property, he's supposed to redeem it by money depending on how close it is to the year of jubilee. Well, what if a man gave it but didn't redeem it, and he sold the property to someone else. Well, at the year of Jubilee, when the property returned back to its original owner, instead of the man owning the property, the priest would own the property. So he would forfeit the property because he did not fulfill his vow. That's what verse 20 and 21 is all about, and you might notice that. Now, notice if you would, in, down in verse uh, 26, it talked about the firstborn among animals. Well, by the way, before I leave this shekel at verse 25, you might want to see Numbers chapter 30, verse 13, where the same uh, definition of a shekel, and of course a shekel was a weight of money, not a coined money, okay? Firstborn among animals. You might remember back in Exodus, uh, excuse me, yes, Exodus chapter 13 and Exodus 34, 19 and 20, that the firstborn of cattle and the firstborn of men belonged to the Lord. It was kind of a came out of the firstborn dying in Egypt. But later on, a man could redeem his firstborn child, and the Levites took their place. So what this is saying in verse 36 is, you can't give a firstborn of the cattle uh, to the Lord because it already belongs to him. But look at verse 27. But it is among the unclean animals. Now you recognize in Exodus 34:20, you could give an unclean animal to the Lord. It, it could not be redeemed. I mean, it could not be sacrificed. Uh, but you could give it to the priest for their use, right? Notice mentions here in verse 28 where it says, Nevertheless, any prescribed thing which a man sets apart to the Lord. This is the word harem, sometimes called under the ban, korban in the New Testament. This is a special kind of vow where you give something to God permanently. It's something set apart for God. It becomes holy like Jericho is holy, and human beings can't use it because it's too holy. Well, that's the idea here. So 28 and 29 are an exception. It's things that are so holy they cannot be redeemed. Now, matter of fact, look at the end of verse 29, that they shall be, man shall be put to death if he sets himself apart and then tries to ransom himself. He can't be ransomed. He can't go back on that kind of vow. Uh, you just have to be put to death. That's a very serious thing. Now, in verse 30, we go about the tithe of the land. Well, you say, well, I thought the tithe always belonged to God. Well, verse 30 through 33 seems to reflect Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 27. The whole problem here is we're not sure of how many tithes there were in ancient Israel. It's obvious there are at least two tithes. One tithe went to the Levites and the Levites were to tithe to the priest. Now that happened every year. You might want to see Numbers 18, 21 through 29, 
Deuteronomy 12, 6 and 7, and Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 27. But there was a tithe that was only given every three years, and that was a tithe to the poor people of your local area. And that's found in Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29. Now, some people assume that this verse 30 is referring to Deuteronomy 14, 22 and 27, which says this, If you have a tithe of your produce, but you're a long way away from the sanctuary, exchange your produce into to a weight of money, take your money to the temple area, buy something there, give a tenth of it or a part of it to the priest, and then eat the rest in fellowship with your God. Now that may be what this is talking about. Why would you want to redeem a tithe? To maybe take it to the sanctuary, right? That's the only reason I can think about redeeming a tithe. So that may be true. So is there two tithes in Israel or three? I'm not sure. But that's obvious that at least there's one tithe every year. Uh, For certain, a second tithe every three years. And possibly it's 20% a year and a third tithe tithe every three years. You don't feel so bad about your income tax now, do you? (laughs) Well, now notice that in verse 34, these are the commands which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel at Mount Sinai. And that gives this credibility again. I believe the Bible is true. And when it says this was given to Moses, I believe that Moses wrote it and that it was given to him by God on Mount Sinai. Now, one reason I think the purpose of Deuteronomy is to explain these laws that God gave at Mount Sinai, which was for a nomadic existence for those 40 years of wilderness wandering, But in Deuteronomy, he's going to kind of reinterpret this for a life in a settled community. And you can see that so clearly in the tithe, how it's expanded in Deuteronomy 14. And I think we have to look at all these vows. Now, the question comes, how these vows relate to the Christian? We must say that we can't be legalistic about this because we're not right with God because we do all these kinds of legal things. But there is a truth here that God's people ought to be separate and different from the pagans around which uh, they live. And there ought to be a uniqueness about our life that honors and shows God. We ought to show God's ownership in everything we do. Now, I think we'll do it in a different way than they did it, maybe. But I think we need to think through, how do I, as a Christian, reflect God's ownership of my family, of my uh, uh, money, of my talents, uh, of my life? How do I reflect that? Well, I think Leviticus says it's important that we do it. We may not do it by bringing an animal and sacrificing it, but the same principles that influence this need to guide our lives. Not to make us right with God, but I think they are God's guidelines for man in society. A really good book in this area that I think you ought to read if you're interested in how to interpret the Old Testament to modern Christian would be uh, John Bright's The Authority of the Old Testament. It's been a great help to me, and I hope you'll look at that. Well, I've enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.